Okay. I'm drinking because there's a time for every purpose under heaven. And uh, YouTube videos are the time for drinking. In my opinion. I wanted to talk about the... I wanted to say pagan, but it's not quite right. The nihilist book, the unchristian book, the not even Jewish book of the Bible. That book is Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes is probably my second favorite book of the Bible. Uh, only second because it is narrative. Uh, Job takes that title, that honor. And Ecclesiastes is interesting because I made a couple of errors in relation to Christianity uh, in my first book, In Defense of Hatred. I did what a lot of novices do, and they look for they look through their Bible for verses which support their um, their own position. And the first verse I used in In Defense of Hatred to support my view that hatred is a a moral capacity, that people who are incapable of hatred are in fact not moral. And I found two verses that supported me, and the first one was Psalm 139, where King David says, Do I not hate them, O Lord, who hate thee? I hate them with a perfect hatred. But of course, anyone who reads Psalm 139 in its entirety knows that it begins as a confession. He says, Lord, I know everything. You know everything about me. I'm going to just share my heart with you, even though you know it all anyways. And then he says, this, he vents. And then at the end, he says, I don't know if I should have felt that way. Guide me on the path of righteousness. Completely different meaning than what you might take if you just take the hatred line out of it. But the second verse I used was from the book I wanted to talk about today, Ecclesiastes. And um, it's the the opening of the third chapter. You know, to everything there's a season. I'm reading from the uh, the hotel Bible here, so it's the, the Gideon and not the proper King James or English Standard or the other good ones, but we all know the verse. You can Google the Greek yourself if you're interested. To everything there is a season, a time for every purpose under heaven, a time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to pluck what is planted, a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to break down and a time to build up, a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance, a time to cast away stones and a time to gather stones, a time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing, a time to gain and a time to lose, a time to keep and a time to throw away, a time to tear and a time to sow, a time to keep silence and a time to speak, a time to love and a time to hate, a time of war and a time of peace. And that's chapter 3, 1 through 8. A time for love and a time for hate. What's, uh, what's to misinterpret about that? Well, it's the first line. It's the, a time for every purpose under heaven. And what Ecclesiastes is, is it is the king of Israel, who's not named. It's not necessarily Solomon, though that's a, a guess some people have. It's some, some old guy who has done everything, basically, and he is going through a thought experiment about the meaning of life without God. And he uses God in a, in a euphemistic sense, like these things are from God um, at various points in Ecclesiastes. But the, but the, the gist of the book is that everything is essentially meaningless, disconnected from your creator, disconnected from God. And so uh, you may as well just enjoy what's good in your work and enjoy the good things in life. Because everything else is vanity. Everything else is grasping at the wind, is, is one translation for it. And um, so when he says to everything there is a season and a time for every purpose under heaven, He's saying that without God, 
everything is contextual. He's not saying that's true from a Christian perspective. And to prove the point, we can flip to um, Galatians, where uh, Paul says, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like, of which I tell you beforehand, just as I also told you in time past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Notice that hatred is on that list. There is no time for hatred in Paul's vision of Christian life. But the fruit of the Spirit, he continues, is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things, there is no law. Now, I'm a pretty pro-love guy. I think love's pretty fantastic. But I'm not a Crowleyite or a, a, a you to love as a temple. No, love isn't a deity. Love is a an expression of something having value. It by itself isn't, um, you don't love love. That's, I guess you could appreciate the feeling, but um, I, I think there are laws. There ought to be laws against love in certain contexts. You know, there is, uh, and I think, I think most people understand that. Um, but if you don't, the book to read on that is Vladimir Nabokov's Lolita, if you can stomach it. Um, most people read it as a book uh, about pedophilia, because it is. The protagonist is also the narrator. And it's especially uncomfortable to read because he's speaking to you, the reader, directly. As if in a courtroom, sort of making his case to the reader about how he wasn't really at fault. It was really the young nymph who was in the wrong and who seduced him and so forth. But what's morally genius, in my opinion, about the book is that it presents the the strongest possible case for pedophilia, which is uh, that it is a form of love. And this used to be uh, Christopher Hitchens' defense of, uh, of homosexuality. He says not just a form of sex, but a form of love. Who could disagree? Who could disagree? But the same would apply for pedophilia. Would it not? If pedophilia it could be a form of love, well, who would we be to criticize that? But of course, it's a reductio ad absurdum. All it proves is that, ah, not all forms of love are moral. You can love the wrong things, or you can love them incorrectly. And I mean, this should even make sense to Christians. You know, you shouldn't love what is evil. Um, all, all the things that Paul's describing, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelry, and the like. <laughs> Hatred among them. So what we see in Ecclesiastes is a view of balance. And, and the author even goes so far as to say, is, you shouldn't be too wise either. Because with much wisdom comes much grief and with much knowledge comes much sorrow. It's a very, what you have in this book, the wisdom that you would live by in a world without God, is actually a picture of balance, enjoying the good things in life, and doing good, doing good work, um, but not taking yourself too seriously either. Not, not being a just a, a laughing idiot. Don't be a fool. He's he's quite clear about that, and it's a it's I think a, a genuine kind of wisdom that the Bible can provide outside of the context of Christianity. Even uh, now, of course, the rest of the Bible 
perhaps makes most sense and, and might even be not just irrelevant, but actually bad advice uh, if the story of Jesus and the relevance of Jesus, you know, the fall, the fallenness of man, sinfulness of the world and all that, if that's not true, then the majority of the advice of the New Testament is bad advice. Do not take it. It is not moral. But what we have in Ecclesiastes is a depiction of wisdom without God. And despite the the emptiness, the lack of objective purpose in the universe. There's, you, you have no relationship with some personal creator of the universe who loves you as you. That's not a thing in Ecclesiastes. In the face of a v vain universe where nothing you do has or even could have you know, significance, how do you live life to, uh, how do you live a good life? And it's actually a pretty good way to start. Life under the sun. How does that work? What does that look like? And um, I think it could be uh, useful and beneficial, not just to, um, not merely to Christians, but also to non-Christians, pagans and atheists and nihilists as well. Food for thought and uh, read your Bible or at least one book of it.